So what are we told about history? Well, the narrative is that we started out primitive, and through years of evolution, we developed fire. Fast forward many years, we have the agricultural revolution. We finally discovered farming, so we moved away from hunting and gathering. This was a major advancement for humanity. So we started farming, we didn't need, constantly need to travel in order to find food. So we were able to build cities. And one of the first cities was Cairo, Egypt, found 4000 BC. People still debate over the constructions of the pyramids given the primitive technology humanity had. So right from one of the earliest civilizations, their ability to build grand structures with primitive tools still remains a mystery. We then have the Industrial Revolution, which consists of trains, cars, factory. Then we fast forward into today, where we are the most technologically advanced we have ever been. Or are we? Napoleon once said, history is a set of lies agreed upon. When we look at old sculptures or buildings, or as a previous example, the Egyptian pyramids, it is very clear to the unprogrammed mind these structures were not built using primitive tools. We have been technologically advanced for a lot longer than we are told. These statues from Bernini are definitely a great indicator that the mainstream historical narrative is not telling the truth. Gian Lorenzo Bernini. He was born December 1598 and died 28th of November 1680. He was an Italian sculptor and architect. While a major figure in the world of architecture, he was more prominently le the leading sculptor of his age. Credited with creating the Baroque style of sculpture, as one scholar has commented, what Shakespeare is to drama, Bernini may be to sculpture. The first pan-European sculpture, don't know what pan-European sculptor means, definitely not pansexual European sculptor, they weren't that fucking retarded back then, whose name is instantaneously identifiable with a particular manner and vision, and whose influence was inordinately powerful. In addition, he was a painter, most small canvases in oil, and a man of the theatre. He wrote, directed, and acted in plays mostly carnival satires for which he designed stage sets and theatrical machinery. He produced designs as well for a wide variety of decorative art objects including lamps, tables, mirrors and even coaches. So from what we are told he was a very busy man. He was a sculptor, architect, painter, he was into drama, he even made some of the um, props and that. So we are told he's a very busy man. But what I want to focus on is his sculpture work. We are told that he hand carved a lot of this stuff. So let's just take a look at that. Here is a list of 10 most famous works of Bernini. Number one on that list. What an amazing sculpture. Number two, we have the Rape of Proserpina. Let's take a look. Number three on that list, Ecstasy of Santa Teresa. Just look at the detail. The point I'm making is that, do these really look carved to you? Is it inconceivable to think that these were poured or even 3D printed? Either way, it goes against the historical narrative. This is number four on that list. Yes, we could just accept the narrative and believe he carved all of this whilst also being an architect, painter, drama, actor, build the props, you name it. But I think that would be foolish. It all just doesn't add up. And it doesn't stop with Bernini. This is the Deception Sculpture by Francesco Qu Quirello. This is an absolute masterpiece. Although this hasn't been carved, you don't carve rope this perfect from a huge piece of stone. This piece alone destroys the historical narrative, because if not carved, then what? Or we can even move on to the Veiled Virgin. How is it possible to carve stone so thin? It isn't. 
I've shown you sculptures that are too perfect to be sculptures. How are they made? I don't know, but it seems as though they use some sort of technology. Far more advanced than that of what we are told. They may have even been more advanced than us. But if you're still not convinced that our past is a set of lies, then let's look at the 1893 Chicago World Fair. The World's Columbian Exposition, or the Chicago World Fair. It was a world fair held in Chicago in 1893 to celebrate the 400th anniversary of Christopher Columbus, arrival in the New World in 1492. The centerpiece of the fair held in Jackson Park was a large water pool representing the voyage Columbus took to the New World. Chicago had won the right to host the fair over several other cities including New York City, Washington and St. Louis. That's not important so much. What is important is this part of what they say here. The exposition covered 690 acres, 2.8 kilometers. Featuring nearly 200 new but deliberately temporary buildings of predominantly neoclassical architecture, canals, and lagoons. People and cultures from 46 countries. So, 200 new but deliberately temporary. Think of that word temporary. Don't forget it. Planning and organizing. The fair was planned in the early 1890s. So it was planned in the early 1890s and it opened in 1893. So a maximum of three years to build all the temporary buildings. So we're going to take a look at such so-called temporary buildings. Now, does this really look temporary to anyone? Because it certainly doesn't to me. And yes, all this has been destroyed now. They say they've been destroyed because they're temporary buildings. There is also stories of fires going through here. But I'm not sure how much I believe of either. Because these are definitely not temporary buildings. So who really built this for one as well? Because an advanced society is only capable of building something like this. These are magnificent buildings. They're something that you'd think you'd see in Lord of the Rings or something. Just mind blowing. The details, all that stonework. And the same civilization that destroys this sort of stuff isn't the same civilization that built this sort of stuff. So what really happened here? This is a souvenir map of World's Columbus Expedition or Chicago World Fair. Take a mental note of what Jackson Park, Chicago looked like back then. This is the Gallery of Fine Arts. Now let's compare this with Jackson Park today. So this is the modern look on Jackson Park. And that building right there is the Gallery of Fine Arts. That's what it was called during the uh, World's Fair, but now it's called the Museum of Science and Industry. So ha take a look at that and compare what the uh, souvenir map looked. And we can see most of where the uh, grand buildings were are now just golf courses or just, you know, just land, just park land, sort of simple stuff. But all the buildings are gone. Now let's look back at this souvenir map and let's look at some of the buildings that uh, were destroyed. Now something on this map really caught my attention and it's this huge building. And on the uh, modern Google Earth version, we can see that's a golf course now. But manufacturers and liberal arts building, let's take a look at what that must have been like. So there we have it. The Manufacturers and Liberal Arts Building of the Chicago World Fair. What really happened in 1893? Why do they lie and say these buildings were temporary when clearly we can see they're made out of stone and they're here to stay? Are they trying to erase our true history? Let's go back to the souvenir map and check out another building. One of the buildings that I thought was absolutely beautiful and mesmerizing from the photos of the World's Fair was that one that stands tall at the end of the lake. This is the administration building. Such a beautiful building. 
Again, does this building look temporary? Does it look built by primitive societies? And why was it destroyed? I'll finish this video off by showing and naming some of the other buildings from the World's Fair while I play guitar. You can sit in awe of the beauty from Jackson Park in 1893. Mm -hmm.